Welcome to Ali Fitness Podcast, a weekly production all about bringing health into fitness. From building people's pools to a success on Wall Street to becoming founder of Spartan Race in 2010, there's not much that Joe DeSena hasn't taken on, and that's without even mentioning the crazy athletic feats he's taken on himself. Joe truly lives up to his quote, which is get comfortable with being uncomfortable. So for those of you who have been living under a rock, a Spartan race is a series of obstacle races of varying distance and difficulty ranging from three miles to marathon distances. It started in the US but is now all over the world and it recently arrived here in Hong Kong and so I thought it very timely that we had Joe on the show. So Joe, thank you for coming on and welcome. Thanks for having me. Very uh, honored to be on your show. Excellent. So firstly, can you give us a bit of a rundown on on why and, and how you even became to start the Spartan Race? Yeah, let's go back in time. Grew up in Queens, New York. Mom stumbles into a health food store in the 1970s. We were a family, just like everybody in the neighborhood and I mean, everybody in the greater New York area, pretty much everywhere, maybe, maybe California was thinking differently, was just eating junk. Right. We were eating uh, raviolis and pizza and pasta and fast food and TV dinners. And she walks into this health food store and she meets a yogi, an Indian that came into town to preach his message. And somehow she buys it hook, line and sinker. And she gets into this whole idea of becoming a vegan and getting into yoga and meditating and she brings this message home, and obviously we all, including my dad, everybody was like, she's a crackpot. <laughs> the neighbors thought she was crazy. Eventually, my parents get divorced. My mom moves to Ithaca, New York, which was a little more open-minded to this kind of thinking, and gets my sister and I to uh, embrace this more. We really didn't do. I had monks in the living room growing up. They would come in and chant and do meditations and just talk about positive energy and we had pictures on the wall of all these gurus. It was weird at the time. My mom taught yoga. Even though we didn't do a ton of it, I think we started through osmosis. It just became accepted. And one of the things she introduced us to was a 3,100-mile race in Queens, New York, around a one-mile loop. And the idea was that your mind is much stronger than your body, much stronger than you think you are. And so that was really the early days for Spartan because it, you fast forward in my life, I, I cleaned pools, I did construction, I built a Wall Street firm. But I think at the end of the day, I really liked getting outside and sweating and doing yoga and being healthy. All that stuff I was doing, I was chasing money. But I really loved when I got out and you know I, I lived. So I had this idea of starting a business that put on races and changed people's lives. And it actually started 17 years ago with a different name. I started under a, a brand, peak.com, P-E-A-K.com. I lost a ton of money for 10 years from 2000 to 2010, trying to put on races that were just too difficult for most people. They were, you know, 300 plus mile races. Nobody was signing up for them. And then in 2010, changed the format, changed the name, and voila, it started to work. We had 700 people show up. Then 1,000, then 1,500. Today, we're in 35 countries. We'll have a million participants a year. It's been incredible. Well, so why in 2010, apart from running out of money, did you think that it was time to change the format? I was sitting at my in-laws. I think it was Thanksgiving. It was 2009. And I didn't want to do a different format. I didn't want to spend more money. But I didn't want to give up on the idea. And I had a buddy. We would do crazy workouts together carrying weights and stuff up and down mountains, dragging canoes. And he kept saying to me, you know, years and years ago on television was this like obstacle course thing. And you should do one of those with barbed wire. And I thought it just sounded hokey and ridiculous. I shrugged it off for many years. And in 2010, I finally embraced it. And I said, you know what, I'll invest a little bit of money. We'll come up with a cool name and I'll try it. This was my last ditch effort to see if this would work. I really did enjoy like making people suffer and struggle and wanted to change their lives. And I guess that's why I did it. I did it against my own judgment, really. So Spartan Race, everyone's heard of it. 
And there's a lot of other obstacle races out there as well, but Spartan Race seems to be the one that everyone talks about. What's the difference between, say, Spartan Race and other obstacle races like Tough Mudder? Well, we don't use those words around here. <laughs> <laughs> I knew you'd say that. <laughs> the big difference is um, everything we do is authentic and athletic. We're not going to do something silly. We're not going to electrocute people or create like a gas mask environment or just we're not going to do stuff that makes a lot of noise, but it's silly in nature. And Spartan is attempting to be a sport, an Olympic sport. So we want consistency of obstacles. We want to time people. We want to rank them. They've got to do their obstacle or do a penalty of 30 burpees. And so those subtle differences really were a big difference because I, you know, I raced myself for 25 years. And you know, it's kind of cool to go to a fun thing once twice maybe with some friends. If I'm going to put time in and I got to explain to my wife why I'm training and running 10 miles a day and not with her, it better be for, you know, something legit, right? Not that I'm going to drink a bunch of beer with some buddies and we're going to get electrocuted. It seems to that, me, that it seems to me that, that a big difference. yeah, it seems to me that you definitely do have fun at Sputton, but there's that difference of actually, we're just not going to give you a medal for turning up. You have to actually compete. You got to earn it. You got to earn it. Excellent. I like it. And so why is there such a growing interest anyway with obstacle races? Why do you think these people who are just everyday mums and dads getting out of their uh, office chairs and doing these crazy feats? Well, I think one, as you and I know, it feels really good to be healthy. It feels really good to sweat and push yourself. The human brain actually changes when we go through difficult times in a positive way. That's a nice reward. The endorphins and everything that get released at the finish line. Your buddies are out there doing it with you. You're reconnecting with the earth. You're getting out of your cubicle. How many people sit in traffic for two or three hours a day? It's a chance to feel alive, I think, is, is the biggest reason. I think triathlon and running and cycling are so linear. They're just that same movement over and over and over. And, you know, I've cycled tens of thousands of miles, as have you. We'll talk about your uh, cycling accident in a little bit. You know, it's just, it's boring. <laughs> and if you, if, you know, and I, I did a lot of Ironman. And the problem is, every Saturday, I've got to go bike five hours. I got to swim a ton. I got to, it's like, it takes up your whole life. 50%, five zero percent of Ironman and, and women get divorced. You know, it's a big commitment. Do you have a Spartan race statistic for us? Oh, I would say 50% get married. <laughs> it's a much lower bar to enter, right? It's, you're, not, you're not putting in five-hour Saturdays. You could if you want to win it, but to get through a Spartan race, not to say it's not a challenge because it is, especially if you're going for your trifecta, which is you know completing the three different distance races in a one-year period, you're going to put in some time, but you're not going to have to put in 20, 25 hours a week. So how much time would you put in? Say you're going for a trifecta, how much time would you put in? And also, what would you do? Where would you go? How would you train? If you were going for your trifecta and you wanted a respectable time, you could get away with an hour a day. You're going to put in an hour a day. Now, I'm a big, you know, I love your message. Don't just be fit, be healthy. So I'm a big yoga fan. You know, the only thing that stops you from finishing races is an injury. I personally believe yoga, I love Bikram yoga because I love to sweat, will help you prevent an injury. So, and that's a 90-minute class. So, you know, yes, you can get away with 60 minutes a day, throw some Bikram yoga in there, you're going to have a few 90-minute days. You don't need five-hour days. Okay, so Bikram yoga is one thing. What else would you do, though, to prepare yourself? You got to do burpees. No way around it. Human's greatest exercise. You got to knock out a bunch of burpees on a daily basis. At the lowest end of the threshold, I would say you're going to do 30 a day. You know, if you're feeling really frisky, do 100 a day, five days a week. You got to do pull-ups. I know they suck. Most people can't do them. So you start out with jump-ups. You're going to do, again, minimum of 30 a day. There are days I do 150, and mine are not great, but over time you get better at them because you're going to have to climb walls. You're going to have to get over things, and nothing builds the upper body like pull-ups. And then you got to do some running. Really burpees, pull-ups, and running can get you a very respectable time 
you know, for a Spartan trifecta. Funny you say burpees because my clients were training for it and they were coming to my kettlebell class. And at worst, I thought, well, I'll just get them to do lots of burpees. That way, if they can't do something, I believe they have to do burpees as a punishment. So I thought at least they'll be able to do their punishment. There you go. <laughs> so are there any facilities that you know of, Joe, that are ideal for training? So let's say someone doesn't want to do their own thing and they want some sort of group exercise. Or Is there anything that you'd recommend? First of all, you can go to any gym out there and get in shape. It's, it's up to you. Most people need the motivation, so you've got to find a coach or a trainer that are gonna, that's going to motivate you. It's great to do classes like you just described because when there's a commitment on the line where people are depending on you to show up and you're embarrassed if you don't, that helps you get through it. And obviously, if you've got a great trainer or coach, that's going to help. We certify coaches. So we have a 1,000 coaches around the world certified. It looks like that number this year will go to 5,000. And they're simply trained in understanding the obstacles we put people through at the races and how to best train for them. That said, you don't have to go get, we call them SGX coaches. You can go get anybody that's a quality coach or trainer that's going to motivate you. And as long as you're doing at the very basics, again, you're not going out to win this thing and, and win our world championship. But at the very basics, if you're doing burpees, pull-ups, and some running, you're going to fight through it. I love all kinds of bodyweight exercises. I love Bikram yoga. I do all kinds of different things, but I'm trying to stay mobile. I'm trying to stay flexible, you know, have some strength, have some overall conditioning. So I do a lot of different stuff. I mix it up. And how would someone become an SGX coach? There's pro- I don't even know. There's probably a website. If you look up Google SGX. But if anybody is interested and they want to, I'm happy to help out your fans and, and people listening to the podcast. Just email me, joe at spartan.com. Happy to help out. Excellent. That's something that I'm going to look into as well. Uh, So next week, actually, we're going to get someone on the show who is someone that Spartans recommended to train with as well, and that's a great CrossFit gym. So so Coastal Fitness is going to come on and talk to us about their program. They've got a specific program for training for Spartans, so we'll talk to them about that. So, Joe, I've been meaning to ask you, what's the danger fact with these races? Because... On the, the rise of Sufferfest, which was a documentary, they suggested that there's more chance of dying on the way to a race, like in a car crash, than actually dying in the race. What are your thoughts on, on the danger side of it? I, I think we should ask you the question, what happened to you a month ago on your bicycle? <laughs> I did have an accident on the bicycle and uh, you're right. I mean, cycling, apart from maybe getting hit by a car or uh, hitting a pedestrian. There's lots of factors that make it quite dangerous. So I dare say cycling's up there with being dangerous. Yeah, I I fell off and got fairly bad concussion and uh, tore seven ligaments. So I assume you don't get those sorts of accidents. No, I mean, people do get hurt, but our injury rates are lowest in the industry. When we look at marathons or triathlon or or Ironman, and we look at us, we have massive numbers of people, again, a million participants a year. Injury rates are really low. And when we scratch our head and say, why is that? I think it's because the imagery and narrative around Spartan is so scary for people that they actually train. They don't come out and just go cold. Whereas I think for, you know, a marathon, they heard about somebody doing it, whatever, or, or an Ironman or triathlon, they just, a lot of them go out and go cold. And, and that's a dangerous thing to do. Mm. not being in in good enough shape to get through something like that. So how do you know if you're in good enough shape? And like what sort of people actually do your races? Well, my 71-year-old mother-in-law did Tokyo not too many months ago, which I didn't know she was doing. So, And then we've got, you know, my son was in uh, Fort Knox this week, and he's 11. He knocked it out with me. And, you know, my daughter has done our beast, and she's eight years old. It's all sizes and shapes. It's people that are committed. You know, they go at their own pace. They do what they can. And the beauty is if you can't get through an obstacle, you do burpees, Hmm. right? Just knock out your burpees. Go as slow as you have to go to get through it. We've had people do a sprint in, you know, five or six hours, whereas the average person is doing it in an hour. You you go at your pace and you get through it. Hmm. So really anyone can do it, but the trick is to train and to train consistently for how long would you start training for if you had a race coming up? It's your first race ever. 
First race ever, I would, look, I can get anybody ready for anything in 30 days. That's my little personal saying. But I would say you want to put in at least 60 days. You want to do a lot of Bikram yoga or some type of yoga because, again, injury is really the only thing that's going to stop you from getting to that finish line. And I believe yoga will help keep your odds low that you'll get injured. I would say you need about 60 days, and I think you're going to be running five days a week. I wrote a book called Spartan Fit. It's a little out there when it comes to the kind of exercises I'm recommending. I'm happy to get a bunch of free copies for your listeners if you want, and you could see the way we think about fitness. Excellent. Oh, that'd be great. Look, if anyone's interested in that, if they email me at ali at ali.fitness, the first uh, 10 people, get a book. How's that? I'll give them to 100. I don't care. I'm easy. Excellent. Okay. Thank you. So, Joe, is there decent prize money when it comes to Spartan races? There is. If you were to follow the circuit and race all our championships around the world and the series and the, and you were to win everything, you'd probably walk away with $100,000 come year end. It's substantial if you're good. Hmm. And what's the likelihood of just stopping at one race? Very low. Our average participant is now uh, doing just shy of three events. Big numbers on people repeating, repeating over and over and over to get that, especially to earn that trifecta, do those three distance races. So it sounds like it's a bit of an addiction. I mean, we got tens of thousands of people with the Spartan logo tattooed on their body from Price Waterhouse executives, all kinds of people. This is a major addiction, but it's a good addiction. It's a healthy addiction. Yeah. So what's your hope for the future of this race? I want to change 100 million lives, and I want this to be an Olympic sport. That's our goal. If I could achieve those two goals, I've done my job here. And how many lives are you up to? Oh, uh, we've got just shy of 5 million lives changed. So I've got, call it, 95 and a half million lives to go. Excellent. And I believe we can help you with some of those because I heard that you might be doing an event in December. Is that uh, in Iceland? It's in Iceland. We're short 350 participants to make it a reality. So I'm happy to give away a couple of entries to your listeners. Great. So they can email you at, and we'll put it in the show notes, but Joe yeah. at, at, at Spartan. Spartan. Spartan.com, yeah. And what is this event? So this is a 24-hour event in December in Iceland. It's going to be epic. It's only 1,000 people. I don't know if you guys get Game of Thrones over there in Hong Kong, but if you could visualize like a really rugged setting and like fires going in the festival area and some tents, it's going to be incredible. And, and I know you're a paleo devotee, so we'll have some meat out there that you can cook over the fires. It'll be, it's going to be an awesome event. Right. And so you've got 350 tickets left. So I encourage everyone in Asia. So is this going to be one of your harder Spartan races or where does this fit into the level? This, this is going to be one of the hardest, but we're going to set up like a relay a division as well. So like, let's say some, you know, there was a team of six that wanted to do four hours each. We're going to do things like that because not everybody can handle 24 hours. So it's a 24 hour race. 24 hour race. And presumably most, you most just laps. keep going. Okay. So most you just. Laps. No. And and how many laps do you think is possible in 24 hours? I mean, somebody amazing might be able to get 15 laps done, five-mile course, 15 laps, 75 miles. Excellent. Well, love to see you there. I think that's great. So, Joe, can we just get a bit personal for a second? I was interested in something that you said about your own life. You mentioned that you, you lived in Japan, and you also said that you now live in New York, and one of the reasons for not living in Japan was that it's just so easy. It's just such a good lifestyle. And that comes back to the quote that I began with about you and your living, getting comfortable with being uncomfortable. Can you tell us a bit more about that? Yeah. So, you know, life is going to throw tough things at all of us. And the better we are at dealing with them, the more successful we'll be in life. And so I don't want our lives, our lives being my family's lives to be too easy. I want to make it a little tougher on our kids. And even, by the way, even tough is not that. I mean, yes, I wake them up at 5.45 a.m. every morning. They got to do their workouts. I made my kids run four miles in the rain today. But that's not, I mean, you go to India, you go to Siberia, you go anywhere really tough on this planet, Syria, Iraq. Our kids, all of our kids, listeners have it way too easy. And so Japan was just like Disneyland squared. Way too easy. I loved it. Never want to leave there, but we got to toughen up the family. 
And so do you think the way to do that is to put them in a place or say grow up in a place that's just harder to get things done or harder to to what? Well, I, I, you know, I think my life changed. I had a pretty easy first 10 years of my life because my dad was doing really well. And only when my dad's life turned upside down and he started to lose everything, my parents got divorced, did I smarten up and get tougher and kind of take destiny into my own hands and, you know, start to take control of things. And so I just, I remember scratching my head as a young person when this very, very wealthy, high society kid, it was in the paper, jumped out of a window and killed himself. And I remember scratching my head thinking, how could that be? How could somebody with, you know, a family worth that kind of money, like doesn't make sense. And I don't know if it was my mother, I don't know who said it to me, but if you have it too easy, there's nothing to strive for. You've got no ability to deal with the adversity, which we just talked about. Life is not as fruitful as it could be when you've seen the other side, right? When you've struggled a bit. And, you know, I got one shot. We've got four children. I got one shot at making their lives the best I can make them. And so this is my belief and my philosophy. Okay. So I think in Asia we'd call you a tiger mum. Yeah, more more like a lion dad. <laughs> <I would say. laughs> so can you just share with us, because we have a lot of people on the listening to, to us who are parents, and can yep. you just share with us a bit about parenting and about your children? And you mentioned that they spoke Mandarin. And can you tell us yeah. about how you've brought them up? Well, your daughter speaks Mandarin, I just learned. So I'm not as crazy as I'm about to sound right now. But we grew up, we raised them on a farm before we moved to Asia. We were on a farm in Vermont where Spartan started. And I had a crazy idea. I told my wife, why don't we hire, if we could afford it, a Kung Fu master that only speaks Mandarin. And we'll get, you know, hopefully he has a wife that could live in the house. And they only speak Mandarin. And we'll have the kids only watch television in Mandarin. They could watch as much TV as they want, but it's got to be in Mandarin. And it worked. They started to speak Mandarin. So A couple of years ago, I said, let's move to Asia. Now, obviously, Singapore is not as tough as going to Shanghai, but we went to Singapore. We got them into a half Mandarin, half English speaking class, all four kids. We're keeping the tradition going, and they're speaking pretty damn good Mandarin right now. They hate me for it, but they'll eventually love it. Hmm. So your wife's the nice one, right? My wife is the nice one. My wife is the puppy mom. (laughs) (laughs) <laughs> I am the I am the lion dad. <laughs> Excellent. Look, before I let you go, Joe, it's been very insightful having you on and very inspiring. And I'm sure lots of people are going to get in touch with us about Iceland um, and about your book. But before I let you go, could you tell us, do you have a tattoo? I do. I have two tattoos and I'm about to get a third tattoo. So it's funny you bring that up. Well, anyway, continue the question. <laughs> that, that, that's the question, but I'd love to hear uh, what they are. You must know this already. Um, one tattoo on my arm is my mother's name, a, a Chinese character. The uh, tattoo on my hip is basically love. It basically says in like, I don't know what language it is, because we were in, I think we were in the south of France. And my wife and I, it was our second date. It was in a race that we didn't finish. And I asked her, hey, since we were planning on spending these three days at the race, would you mind? My buddy rented a house in the south of France. We'll go spend three days there. She agreed. We stopped in a casino on the way. This is our second date. And I said, let's go in to that casino. Neither of us gamble. We'll go to the roulette wheel. I said, what's your number? She said, black eight. She said, what's what's your number? I said, red 36. I said, I'll bet my number. You bet your number. If your number hits... You leave. We never see each other again. My number hits. We get married on the spot. If zero, which is the green color, comes out, I get a tattoo. Double zero green, you get a tattoo. Anyway, first roll, my number hits. We're supposed to get married on the spot. She can't believe it. I can't believe it. We ultimately got married. We didn't get married on the spot. The next roll was she gets a tattoo. We found a tattoo parlor the next day. She got on the table, and then she started to sniffle that her mother was going to flip out, so I took the tattoo. That was my second one on my hip. The third tattoo that I'm about to get is I was recently with a bunch of wounded warriors that attend, frequent a bunch of Spartan races, and they call themselves Oscar Mike because it's a call sign in the military, in the U.S. military. It basically means on the move. And the gentleman that started uh, was hit by a car. 
he's in a wheelchair. He's debilitated. He's not, he's not able to move much other than in the wheelchair. And I said, do you have a tattoo of Oscar Mike, you know, the, his new charity? And he said, no, do you have a tattoo of Spartan? And I said, no. And I said, I'll tell you what, I'll get a tattoo in August. I think August 28th, I forget it, because we're going to be at a race together of Oscar Mike and you get a tattoo of Spartan. I got a third tattoo coming. That is great. And more importantly, that second story, apart from the interesting uh, way you got the tattoo, I'm more interested in the fact that you didn't finish a race. What's that all about? We were a team of four. We were training really hard. We were racing in Scotland. It was an awesome race and we were doing really well. My now wife, who again, this was our second date. She was there just as a support crew, was watching our navigator, the fourth member of our team, who we didn't know that well. The three of us were pretty tight bond, but this fourth person wasn't, wasn't as tight, but he was an incredible navigator. He dropped out. He just, we were moving at a pace that was uncomfortable for all of us. We were all broken. He didn't want to continue. And in those kinds of races, once a team member's out, you're out. So on the one hand, it was upsetting. On the other hand, out of the corner of my eye, I could see my new wife. So I was like, this is going to be pretty good. I'm going to go, um, go to my friend's house in South of France, try to convince her to marry me. <laughs> No. So you had a bit of ulterior motive for that one. But did you yeah. learn anything about teamwork or was that something that you already knew? I did learn a lot about teamwork in those races. Reflecting back, there were two races where that occurred with two different team members. And, you know, it's like watching children in a playground when there's two or three friends that are bonded together and there's a new person that comes in that doesn't really click in. If you don't figure that out as the leader, you're going to have situations where you don't finish races or you don't get the most out of your team. You've got to figure out a way to get people collaborating and working together. And I think we failed to do that. And, and both times we failed to do that, we, we didn't have good results. Mm. And more importantly, this was the navigator you're talking about. This was our key person. So you always make sure you look out to the way, navigator. By the way, this was our key. In both the races, both times it was the navigator. Ooh. One yeah. thing one thing I learned in team races is always take care of the navigator. That's right. <laughs> well, on that note, Joe, once again, thank you so much for coming on and hopefully we'll see you in Iceland. We will definitely see you in Iceland. Good luck uh, on the recovery and keep your daughter uh, learning Mandarin. Excellent. Thanks so much, Joe. Thanks. For all the resources and show notes from today's episode, please go to www.ally.fitness. If you liked today's episode, please show your appreciation by going to iTunes, give us a five-star review and subscribe. Subscribe.